<laughs> yeah, keep on whispering. Oh, no. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? How's everybody doing tonight? Awesomely well. Awesomely well. Can you hear us, Corey? Yes. I hear you echoing back there. <laughs> okay. Good to see everybody. Hello, crew back there. Hello there. I'd like to say good evening to everyone. Welcome you to our Christian on uh, Point broadcast. Uh, glad to be back. Missed last week. Seemed like it's been a month. Glad to be back. We had a great time on our vacation, but it's nothing like being back home. <laughs> Doing what you love to do. I want to welcome everybody out tonight. Um, as we said, those who are on the phone can star six if you want to chime in. Uh, we will open up with a word of prayer and get started. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord, for your guidance, your mercy, and your grace, and your provision for prosperity and good health, Lord God. We thank you for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Father. And we thank you, dear Lord, for the victory that you accomplished for us on the cross through your death, burial, and resurrection, and the authority, dear Lord, that you have provided for us to carry out your will and your plan for our lives. Father, we've come tonight to study your word, to sharpen one another, to open our hearts and our minds to a deeper knowledge and understanding of you and what's required of us, dear Lord, and what we can expect of you, that we may be focused on what's important, dear Lord, and that's glorifying you. Bless this time together tonight, dear Lord. Bless all the heroes, Lord God. I pray that you bless the hearts of the heroes to share, that we may really be open to all that you have to offer, for, because we all bring a valuable piece to the puzzle. Uh, that division may be complete. Glorify yourself in this setting, dear Lord. And it's your authority we pray and thank you, Father. Amen. All right. As I said, I'd just like to welcome everybody back out as we get ready to go into our lesson tonight. Uh, we've been talking about faith building. And we left off last time. Uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that we weren't uh, getting on a path of legalism as we are pursuing righteousness in our lifestyles uh, because uh, the law was never intended to uh, make anyone righteous. Matter of fact, it was never even intended for, for the righteous. It was as our tutor, a guide, to remind us when we weren't in line with God. Um, and unfortunately, um, because of uh, a lack of understanding, uh, and I think we still wrestle with that today. That's why I wanted to have that conversation to make sure that you didn't have a list of do's and don'ts out in front of you, uh, judging your relationship with God, and more importantly that, uh, judging others' relationships in your world. Uh, because it's very easy to do if we don't truly understand the law of love. Uh, and that law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, body, strength, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself and love does no harm to his neighbor and one thing we've come to understand and we must continue to reiterate unconditional love requires no change it inspires change that's why we must have a clear understanding of 
uh, serving God and what that looks like because that's what attracts people to Christ. When they can see God at work, when they can see that unconditional love, uh, that faithfulness to what you say you believe without compromise. Uh, and that's what we talked about the last time, you know, um, getting to the place where we don't compromise our relationship with God, our relationship with man, and our values. And um, I asked the question last time we were together is, what is your faith statement? Because we found that um, the only way that you can please God is through faith. And we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Uh, so as you start off in your walk with God, you have to come to understand what it is you're believing God for. Uh, what is your faith in God for? Uh, because that is going to be the motivation. And we talked about that last week. Uh, can somebody kind of uh, chime in and um, share some of the things we talked about last week, if you took notes, the last time we were together? So we can pick up where we left off and move on into uh, the faith building. Anyone? Um, kind of recap some of the things we talked about. Um, Want to pick up where we left off so we can move on. Because I think the question I asked was, what would you have to do to glorify God um, and to be in line with his purpose and mission for your life? And what is his command? Um, as we said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Anybody have any questions or comments on any of that before we move on? If not, I'm getting ready. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, make sure you're still alive. Uh, which uh, faith builder did we stop on? Was it verse 6 where we were told to add perseverance to our faith? Or did we do that one? My audio connection has been lost. Isn't that something? Okay. That's enough. Um, well, we talked. We had a, the question asked. Um, we went over First Corinthians, just talking about um, being free from the law and uh, free to live a righteous life and um, live as servants for God and um, and the boundaries with our freedoms that we have in Christ. And then we asked the question: uh, What do you want? And uh, desire to glorify God in all things. And um, why do we want it? And you gave us verses for those things. And then the question, will your actions improve your relationship with God? Tom, you got your bed closed out? That's all I have for my notes. Is anyone there? Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear us? I can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Were you all able to hear me? Yeah. But we can't hear Pastor. I don't know if he's still talking. He might not. Okay. He got up here. His audio has been lost. 
Oh, okay, I'm back. I had muted myself also. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I lost audio there for a moment. I was trying to get it squared away. Muted myself and forgot to cut it back on. Okay, what was the last uh, faith builder that we stopped on? Was it adding perseverance? Self-control. Self-control was the last one? I believe so. Is that a confirmation from everyone? Was adding self-control the last? Yeah, we started self-control. I got self-control in Romans 6, 1 through 12. Oh, okay. All right, because I want to make sure as we're building our faith, you know, everybody talks about serving God, being a Christian, living for God. You know, what is it all about? As we've discussed before, you know, it all happened when Adam disobeyed God. Man lost control lost the authority to carry out God's will for his life. It's never been about us, what we want, what we want to do, what we want to accomplish. God created us as we did, uh, studied at the beginning, that he created us in his image and his likeness, and we found out that meant that we were created to carry out, uh, be an exact representation of his character. That's who we are created to be, but the enemy through his deception has led us to believe that there's no way possible to live in obedience to God or to um, be who God has created us to be. The strange thing is living in disobedience to God, and that's why we have to, we're going through this process of reprogramming our minds so we can really um, start to line up with God's words because we've got to keep in, our, keep in our mind that our mind is just a tool. It's not us. And I think one of the biggest struggles with becoming a Christian is being able to really identify the real you. The real you is the spirit, that part that God blew in the man at creation. That's the real you. That's the part that's created in the image and likeness of God. It has always wanted to do right. It will always do right. It will never go against the will of God. The problem is that when Adam sinned, the real you was sold into slavery to your senses and your desires. You know, Eve saw that it was good for food, saw that it was good uh, to make one wise like God, and saw that it was pleasant. Uh, and those three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is what drives our human nature. Satan took our mind and programmed it to think that it is really us and acting on our behalf. But it's not. It's just like a computer. It has to be programmed. That's why when a child is born, they're born innocent. Uh, but they And they come in with a blank disc, so to speak. And the minute they open their eyes, they start learning, absorbing information and data. That's why it's very important uh, that we start putting the right information in their minds so that their minds be programmed, but also teach them who they are. And that's what we are doing now. We are coming to know who we really are. And we are now studying the word of God that shows us the principles and the truths that we need to program in our mind on a consistent basis. And that allows the real you to start, be free to start taking more and more control through the power of the Holy Spirit leading you in those truths that you put your faith in. And you have to put your faith in it without understanding it first. Because that's what faith is. And it's always in hindsight that God explains why he led you to do thus and thus based on the word of God and allows you to uh, really better understand the word of God once you apply it. And with all of that said, uh, because the, everything is based on faith, faith is this thing you need to, you need to focus on. Uh, also to remind us that we talked about saving faith which only gets you into the family. Every human being has saving faith because that's a decision you have to make before the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. You have that faith, that saving faith because of how God created you. And if you look at Romans chapter 1, I think we may have already studied, but I want to make sure we are refreshing our minds where it talks about the wrath of God, Romans chapter 1. Starting at verse 18, that saving faith every human being has based on how God created us. Uh, starting at verse 18, if I could get someone to 
read that 18 through um, 20, uh, 32. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all, all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God, God is planned to them. Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were, were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for, for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to, to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, and ruthless. Although they, they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. All right, you see what it said? Because um, this is what Jesus says. No one comes unto him unless they've been taught by the Father. That means no one seeks Jesus for salvation unless they've been taught by God. Well, from the time that you're born, through your surroundings, through people telling you about God and the things of God, uh, that that's God teaching on how God has uh, interacted in your life uh, through things that have happened. Uh, you know, uh, throughout our lives, we, we before we come to know God, we've been in situations where we would say, "Man, that that was nothing but God." But was God constantly revealing Himself to us? We we knew that there was a God, but you know, weren't ready to serve Him. Um, sometimes weren't really sure. But it was God's way of teaching us and bringing us to that place where you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You may have tried to come a lot of times before you were sick and tired and stayed for a while and drifted away. But when you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that happens when God brings you to the end of yourself, uh, brings you to the end of your intelligence, the end of your resources, to the end of all the things that you've been doing to try to find satisfaction and gratification, all the things that you've chased to satisfy that spot on the inside uh, that haven't filled it. When you come to the end, there's a place when you turn to God. Every human being gets that opportunity. And that's why we want to make sure we understand that there is a role that we have to play in this process. And that's what we are talking about now. If you truly want to serve God, this is one thing that you have to do. You have to add to your faith these things. And if you look at these things he's telling you to add, these are usually things that have to do with um, your, your relationships with other people, 
and your relationship with yourself. Like when you talk about self-control, you know, a lot of times you can get in a situation, people, they'll cause you to lose control. Uh, even with things you have promised to yourself, you lose control. So it's your responsibility to add self-control. And we asked the question, how do you add self-control to your faith? And we said, look at Romans six twelve, which told us the things that we needed to do. Um, matter of fact, let's go over Romans six twelve uh, through fourteen. Uh, read those verses again because uh, there's a false consumption assumption that uh, Jesus is going to do it all for you, or the Holy Spirit is going to do you, do it all for you. The Holy Spirit will lead you into what you say you have faith in. And that's going to lead you to into places that you usually fail at. Like if your problem is trying to be self-controlled in eating, he'll take you out to your favorite foods and I'll allow them to be free or easy access just to see where you practice self-control. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Therefore, do not sin. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal, mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. All right. That's what you have to do. That's where it really, that's where you have to understand and know uh, who you are in Christ. Uh, you have to understand the authority that you've been given and how to use it. Uh, but you also have to search yourself and ask yourself, do I really, really love God? Or, or am I in love with the idea of loving God? Uh, because to love God means you're going to do what pleases him. Colossians 3.5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. See what it says? You have to put it to death. The Holy Spirit is not going to do it for you. You have to do it. He will assist you in that process, but you have to do your part. That means um, a lot of that requires avoiding situations until you grow strong enough in your faith to um, be able to handle it. You know, you if you quit drinking, there's no need to go hang out at the bar. I mean, you know, there'll be a time when you'll be able to go to the bar and be around people drinking uh, once you grow in your faith and your love for God. Because it all starts off with a desire to love God. But if you don't have the solid foundation uh, to hold you, uh, eventually you're going to go back. And that's the thing that um, is very important for us to understand that once you decide that you want to serve the Lord, you have to put yourself in an environment that's conducive to spiritual growth, uh, not constantly being attacked and um, being tempted to be led away, which you can't hide from the temptation, but uh, you have to use wisdom in the process and allow yourself opportunity to grow uh, with that. Anyone have any comments or thoughts along that process before we move to the next one? Um, because the next one in verse 6 is, uh, we are told to add to self-control uh, perseverance. And I want you to really see the wording, how it has a self-control, perseverance. To have self-control, that means you got to persevere. <laughs> that means you can't give up. So that means you have to stay under control until you get to the place uh, that you're going. Uh, and perseverance is patience or endurance in doing what is right, never giving in to temptation or trial. It is that spiritual staying power that will die before it gives in. It is the virtue which can endure not simply by not protesting, but with excited hope of what is to come. Excited hope about what's to come. See, the only way you can have excited hope through your trials and tribulations, you really got to be in love. And we talked about being in love with uh, someone. 
Uh, think of all the things that you met when you were younger. Uh, I guess your first love, when you first started experiencing love, what you thought was love. Uh, the sacrifices that you made to uh, experience it. Stay on the phone all night, and the only thing you're doing breathing on the phone. Uh, Got to give it, get up to go to work at 6 o'clock, but you'll stay on the phone at 5. Go to work just with a smile on your face. Can't wait to get off to get back on the phone or go see your love. You know, stay up all night, travel miles and miles, uh, spend your last dime, you know, run out of gas, or almost run out of gas. You'll take those chances uh, to be with your loved one or to do something that pleases them. You cut all your previous acquaintances loose because uh, you're always hanging out with your ladies, especially guys. I don't know about ladies on their side. Um, and, that, and that's kind of the discussion uh, you have to talk, have with yourself. Do I really love God? Now, understand this. Love for God is not an emotion. Those butterfly feel, feelings, those chill bumps on your arms, that's not love. Love is an action verb. This word is an action verb. Love does. God so loved the world, he gave. Love serves the one that it loves, and it seeks to please them at all times. Any comments on that out there? Make sure I'm not here alone. While you're thinking about it, look at Hebrews chapter 10. So we can see how do you add perseverance to your faith. What are some of the things that you must do out there listening uh, to strengthen your faith in God's word. Uh, and we talked about, uh, you know, what your hope should be. Uh, even from a selfish perspective, God said that if you obey him, everything that you put your hands to will be blessed. He will make you the head, not the tail, lenders, not borrowers. He said, don't pursue clothes or food or what you gonna, where you're going to stay, but seek ye first his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. It's a single focus that you can have and still enjoy all that life has to offer. I think that's a pretty good deal if we really learn how to do it. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to per persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. You will receive what has been promised. Go all the way down to the uh, verse 39, sister. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but, and but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back, and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. All right. For those out there that have been told you can backslide, or you have been told you're okay, you just backslidden, do not fall for that because as you see here, we are not of those that shrink back. When the scripture talks about backsliding, it is talking about the children of Israel. Why? Because they were chosen by God, even though they crucified Jesus as a nation, because he chose them, they're still going to be his children. And not only that, they are going to have an opportunity to be saved during the um, tribulation period. Unfortunately, Gentiles, that's you and me, if you're not a Jew, this is your time. This is the time of the Gentiles. Matter of fact, God is so serious about this. He said in his word in 1 Thessalonians that if you end up in the tribulation period, he will make it so that you do not change your mind to be saved because you enjoyed your pleasures here on earth and did not want to turn to righteousness. I think God is pretty serious about us adding to our faith to make sure we don't stumble or fall. 
somebody should have a comment on that one. You are not a backslider. And if you are living in sin, it's because you love it. There's no such thing as a believer today backsliding if you're not a Jew. That should rouse somebody up out there. Go on. Say it. Say what's on your mind. I know you think you're backslidden and you have an opportunity. I have, I have something to say, Pastor Palmer. Go right ahead. So, um, I actually, everything that you're talking about, I actually um, was just having this conversation with Cola in the car today okay. and, and been having conversations with her about this, ex, this exact very thing. And anybody who's friends with me on Facebook knows that this is something that has been very heavy on my mind about okay. really making a decision to really evaluate yourself and to know it. Like if you feel that you want to practice sin, then you can't, you don't love God. You don't, you don't love him. I mean, that's just how I feel. I don't know, but I just got to a place where I felt like if I, I'm going to continue to do these things, I, I can't, I need to question myself. I need to be uncomfortable with these things that I'm doing. And if I'm not, then I can't. That means I don't love God. Wow, that's I, a powerful statement. I don't love him. And, just, and, you, and, and I was just talking to Cole in the car about how when it's almost like what you mentioned, like a relationship, same thing. Mm -hmm. You feel when you're in that relationship, when, when you disappoint that person, you feel emotion from it. You want to work towards not doing that again, that thing that disappointed them mm -hmm. again. So when you get in the habit of constantly disappointing that person, then you have to question yourself and say, well, do I really love that person? Well, it's the same with God. You know, mm -hmm. you're in a relationship with God. So it's the same thing, right? Exactly. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I want somebody to read verses 1 through um, 10. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be, he ha has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you that he, that but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who, go, who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in Hello? Hello? Can anybody hear me? I lost you, Renika, or did I? you all lose me? My audio connection has been lost.
Hello, I'm back. Can you all hear me now? I lost my... Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. All right, so you see what it says. That's the word of God. And But the key was, why is it impossible for a child of God to practice sin? Because if you're born again, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. That's why he says we are not of those that backslide or, or move away from God. You're always moving toward God. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that are sincere about serving God, but they have been misled on how to become a child of God. You'd be amazed of how many people are in church each Sunday or, or say they serve the Lord and are sincere, but they were told to come before the church, repeat some, ah, Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> I lost my connection again. Can you all hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Wow, yeah. getting kind of old. Y'all praying out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Satan must be angry. He thought I was gone. <laughs> all right, but you see what it says? That's why we, as we're studying the Word of God, we really have to understand because we know when we are sinning. Now, we've tried to make ourselves believe, uh, and I think that's because a lot of times um, people have really tried on their own to uh, do the right thing, but it can only last for short periods of time. And as I was saying before I got cut off, a lot of people have been led to believe just by uh, quoting Romans chapter 10, if you believe with your mouth, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved, and then get baptized, dunked in water, People are being led to believe that they're saved. Uh, we just come out of a bunch of revivals. I mean, uh, uh, what do you call it? Vacation Bible School. And each year, everybody's on their quota thing. And they bring kids in. Parents bring kids in. And they come in. Someone talks them into quoting these scriptures, then uh, convincing them to get baptized. And they're told that they're saved. And they grow up believing that they're saved. And that's what the church is mostly filled of. No one is really taught what being born again means. I mean, what's the responsibility? Um, how to live the life? <clears throat> um, what God expects of you and, and what um, you can expect from God. And that's why you just hear these re religious cliches constantly throughout. Trust the Lord. Believe in the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Uh, let go and let God. What does that look like? You know, you need to know how to Love God when you are getting cut off in traffic. People are stealing from you, cursing you, hurting you, hurting your loved ones. You still have to glorify God, and you can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. So the sister made a very good point, um, and that's something we're going to have to come to terms with. If you are sinning and then on top of that comfortable with it, that's a good strong possibility that you don't know God. Matter of fact, that's what God says. You, you don't even know him. God is harsh. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt, but look what God says. Comments on that point. Because something has to be done. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you there on that point. Uh, like the young lady was saying, um, 
you like that scripture was saying though first it says no one who was born of God would continue to sin. This say you wouldn't sin, but if you get comfortable with it, yeah. There's a good good strong possibility that you don't love God. But if if it happens and you don't feel any um remorse or guilt and, and your conscience won't let you continue to keep doing these things. You know, it reminds me a lot of my walk, you know, certain things that I was going through in certain places. I, Constantly bring me back to the time that I was you know, getting in that truck that morning, you know, and just brought me to tears, you know. Just you can't continue to do those things when it's not lining up with what God says. If you're truly looking to serve God, exactly. Doing right, you just can't be comfortable with. And it's too many people professing to know God that not only are comfortable with sin, but think it's okay. They are actually teaching that if you pray before you sin and pray after your sin, you're all right with God. And they say because of grace. Well, the Greek term for grace means the divine influence upon the heart reflected in the life, which is what Second Peter is talking about in the beginning. His, uh, his, divine, his, his uh, promise has given us uh, opportunity to be partakers of the divine nature the very character of God, which is what we were created to be. Uh, that's why it's very important that we understand that uh, your your walk with God is work because you are reprogramming your mind uh, to do something totally against the grain of what it believes and desires. And it's going to be a challenge. And the only way that you will be successful is through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. That's why you must be born again. Just going to church, Bible study, that won't make you born again. That won't empower you. And that's what God talks about in, I think, 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says in the last times, there were perilous times because people would be lovers of themselves and haters of God. Uh, but he says they have a form of godliness, but they have denied the power. And that's why we see, wow. That's why most people have a bad taste when it comes to church because there's so many professing believers that the only thing they can do is take the word of God and try to beat you up with it. But in the same breath, they're doing the exact same things that they're trying to condemn you about. Uh, and that's why, you know, people try to surround themselves with people that they think are in worse shape than they are so they can make themselves look good. And it's another reason why people are always looking to find a person's shortcomings rather than to identify their positive traits and build on that because people always want to prove that they're not all of that. And that's because they have some flaws themselves that they struggle with. All right. Anything else anyone would like to share? So uh, and I, as the sister was saying, though, before we move on, yeah, some decisions are going to have to be made. Um, and you're going to have to decide who and what you love the most. That's what it all boils down to. Who and what do I love the most? I would just also add that in my, personally, it just wasn't enough for me to just be uncomfortable with, with it, okay. which is why a lot of people feel the need to even pray, I guess this new doctrine, pray before and after, because maybe they are uncomfortable with it, and they, but but they don't love God enough to make the decision not to do it. So whatever that thing is, is more, more um, desirable than than a relationship with God. So I mean, I'm not even saying that you can't be uncomfortable with it, but being uncomfortable, it takes some some action, like you said. Yeah. Which the action calls. Hello. You broke up. Did you all lose me? Did I lose her? Hello? Okay, my connection has been lost. Attempting to reconnect. Can anybody hear me? I'm back again. <laughs> I'm back again. 
I lost you at the end, CC. I was just saying, I, I think what people is is not even really just enough to even be uncomfortable. People are uncomfortable. I, I think people are uncomfortable. I mean, if you know, if you know God, you know the Word of God. You you're going to be uncomfortable because you know that there's no justification for sin. But in our minds, we try to justify. It. So that's why we want to like, you know pray before and pray after that but but whatever that thing is that you can't give up obviously is more important to you than having a relationship with God so it's just not enough to just be uncomfortable with it you have to give some sort of action yeah and that's why we talk about as you come into your walk with God just like with anything else you need to have a purpose you know your values you have to know what they are and um uh, you need to put something in place to actually going to help you carry those out. Unfortunately, uh, most people just go through life without any kind of plan about anything and just kind of uh, become a victim to happenstance and kind of react to their day rather than respond to it in a constructive way that's going to lead them in a particular direction um, according to their vision and their values. And that's why we stress so much of uh, having life goals and a life plan. Um, surrounded around your value system for God and God's vision for our lives to lead us and keep us on the path so we can be able to uh, analyze the data of our behavior on a regular basis and to see whether our actions are lining up with the Word of God or not. And that's why we're constantly uh, doing a spiritual evaluation of ourselves. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to do a spiritual evaluation. You know, Go through your day and say, okay, um, did I line up with the Word of God today? And if I didn't, uh, what prevented me from doing that? And what do I need to do uh, to fix that so that I don't be practicing the things that I don't want to be doing? Um, and that's how you add perseverance to your faith. That means you just got to stand on the Word of God because, and I guess uh, per, in perseverance, uh, one of the things that, I, that have been most most effective for me is it's not having any expectations. And what I mean by that is is that uh, some people seem to think that, okay, if I do what God says, that means that this and this is going to happen for me. That's not necessarily true. It's more not true than true. What will happen through your perseverance and obeying God, you will continually be tested to see how real that faith is. Because the enemy believes that we have a a give up point. You know, like some people say, I've had faith long enough. I've been patient with you long enough. I've tried this long enough. Um, and they go through all these things. And after a while, they, they give up. They have a quitting place. And that's what the enemy is banking on. That's why we have to make up our mind in the beginning is God's is God's word true? That means that if it's true, no matter how long it takes it to materialize, it is still true. That means I have to persevere and wait for the outcome. And the outcome that you're looking for is not the thing you're trying to do. It's the thing that God is trying to do to you, which is transform you into the image of God. And that's what wandering in the wilderness for 40 years represents. It represents that the children of Israel, through all of God's miracles and things that he did in their life to reveal himself to them, they still complained and murmured in how the days were unfolding. If you know that God is transforming you into the image of his son, that everything is working for your good, that good doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have money or other things. Those things will come, but that is not the purpose. The purpose is your transformation, where your life starts to look more and more like Jesus on a regular basis. So much so, you don't have to wear a cross or any kind of spiritual, religious, memorable um, trinkets or whatever. People will start to notice through your behavior and your character that there's something good going on with you. And people are going to start to want to spend more time with you because you're going to start to bring joy, security, um, peace, 
and a sense of what's the word I want to a sense of joy and happiness uh, in people's lives. And that's the character of God. And you will start to attract people to you. They won't know why, but it will be the character of God that they're seeing. And But the enemy is constantly accusing us of being quitters. Eventually, we're going to give up. And unfortunately, most people give up right at uh, their blessing. So, come on, there's lots of houses available. Okay. <laughs> So, any comments? Because I guess on that note, you need to really look at your value system about your love for God. Yes. Let's go back to first six then in Second Peter chapter two, verses three through seven. Hello? Yes. Hello, Pastor. Yes. Okay. Right. So so just just for a clear understanding. So um perseverance. It is sum it up with it is um it's the ability to stand on the word of God regardless of your outcome? Yes. Regardless okay. of your circumstance, even in teaching and sharing the word of God, like even with my testimony, you know, I mean, for years, you know, teaching, uh, teaching the things of God when my life didn't represent any of it physically. I, matter of fact, it was the exact opposite. But do you stop teaching the truth and standing on that truth just because your life doesn't represent it? Do you stop teaching that God wants you to have prosperity and good health if you're poor and struggling? See, that's all part of the process to see do you trust God's word based on his word or does something need to happen for it to be true to you? And it's through that perseverance that you start to really grow in your knowledge and understanding of God and yourself. But you also grow to a place where you can be trusted with the word of God because the word of God is true simply because God said it. And once you go through that process, you stop trying to prove that God's word is true. This this keeps you out of those arguments with people about the word of God because it's their God-given right to choose whatever they want to choose. And I can understand somebody believing it's not true if they haven't practiced it or tried it themselves. You know, it's just like uh, like I, I used that uh, the concept of, you know, a lot of your multi-level marketing uh, business ideas. Most of those business ideas are good. That's a solid foundation that they have. But see, what they fail to leave out is the amount of work, effort, energy, and time that's going to be spent to obtain the level of success that it is you're looking for. Most people are not willing to make that kind of sacrifice for anything, really. And those that are successful are the ones that, you know, they'll travel all over the country. They'll stay up late at night. They'll call a million people. They'll talk to every person they see. They'll do what it is they need to do. They'll max out credit cards to get to that place. You know, that's the sacrifice they're willing to make. And those that go that route are the, usually the ones that become the most successful. Well, it's the same thing it is with the Word of God. I mean, this is the only thing that I have got involved in where the percenter of it tells you everything and does everything look like to discourage you from following him. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you got to forsake mother, father, brother, and sister. Give up all you have. Give it away and follow me. Uh, you know, you got to die to yourself daily. You know, you got to stop. Uh, um, you know, turn your back on life as you know it. All the things that were valuable to you, the world system, you got to count that as worthless. It don't even count. It doesn't sound like he's trying to impress me. You get what I'm saying? But everything else is trying to, they try to give you this great picture and leave out all the rough details. Jesus leaves out the good stuff basically and tell you all the hard stuff. You're going you're gonna to suffer. It's going to require great suffering and struggle and hardship and you know, and you got to press your way in. It's a narrow road. Very few that find it. But if you 
mope around like somebody's searching for keys in the dark, you you may find me. That don't sound like he trying to encourage you to follow him. But those that don't understand it, they try to sell you a bit of bill of goods like all your problems are going to be solved. So perseverance, that's why a lot of people give up because they have been sold this false bag of goods that don't work. Did that answer your question any? Yes, sir. That means you can't give up. You know, the thing about even the things that you've gone through the, in your own personal walk, hey, it's a lot of times, you know, you want to give up. <laughs> and that's what the enemy was counting on. So appreciate that insight because that is perseverance is the key. In verse 6, we are told to add godliness to our faith, which means the ability to live loyally, reverently, and obediently toward God. It actually means to imitate God. So how do you do it? Romans 12, 1 through 3. Somebody read that as we're coming down to the end. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. All right. Wow. Present your body to God as a living sacrifice. Keep in mind that we said we don't want to get into a legalistic approach, right? So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Because we want to understand that we are free in Christ. God is not going to make you do anything. You have to decide for yourself. I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. See so what he says? You're free. And this is what God is, is basically saying. Listen, you're free to do whatever you want to do. But you have to understand that everything is not beneficial for you. Now, if you really want to come spend eternity with God, you have to determine from the word what's going to be beneficial to you in accomplishing that goal. Now, if you have no desire to spend eternity with God, do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. But you have to decide. You have to know the word of God and know what's going to be beneficial to you and what you're trying to accomplish 
in your relationship with God and the things that God has promised. Uh, matter of fact, look at Romans chapter 6. Because when we are free in Christ, we are now free to obey God. Where before we became born again, we didn't have the right to obey God. We couldn't obey God. Romans chapter 6, 20 through 23. You were, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefits did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves, to, slaves of God, the benefits you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See what he's saying? When we, before we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we were free from righteousness. We couldn't do righteousness. And, and that's where your heart has to go out for people <coughs> that truly don't understand what being born again is, but have a desire to serve God. Because most of the people I see are sincere. They just have a, a, a lack of understanding of what being born again is. And because they haven't truly been born again, they don't have the power to live in obedience to God. That's why we can't give in to what people are telling us about whether they're born again or not. We have to observe their fruit. And that helps us um, understand what message we have to give to them. You know, there's no need to talk about going to heaven if you haven't gotten into the family yet. You don't, you don't need to talk about the last seven words of Jesus and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And the enemy has us distracted on a lot of things that that have no relevance in your uh, being born again and spending eternity with God. And if you observe the things that people have busied themselves with, none of it makes any difference one way, one way or another in getting into heaven. And so that's why we have to understand the importance of really understanding what being born again is and what a child of God is supposed to look like and our obligation because we are obligated to serve God. Romans chapter 8. Then we will bring it down to a close. Um, Romans chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 6. No, I'm sorry. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I am um, Romans chapter eight is what I'm looking for. Romans chapter eight verses um nine through 11. I'll get someone to read that. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even your body, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the, his Spirit who lives in you. All the way to verse 14. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. See what he says? This is what the Holy Spirit's responsibility to us is. is to lead us into the things of righteousness. And we are, if you are born again, you are obligated to God. Nothing else, not yourself, you're obligated to God. But look at the reward. God promised to give you more than you could ever imagine 
if you pursue righteousness and the life that he created us to live. So um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We've come down to an end, but I really want us to think about, uh, you know, in building our faith uh, and the outcome has to be righteousness. So your pursuit in life should be righteousness. Uh, your faith statement should be righteousness uh, because within that, everything that you could ever desire in life is promised to you. And that's the simplicity of God. He doesn't give us a lot of things to occupy our mind with like religion does. All the things to keep up with and remember. Focus on righteousness, which is what he created you to do. And the real you, that's what it craves. He craves righteousness. That's why we have to reprogram our mind and understand that the Holy Spirit will lead you into that righteousness. You just have to go through the pain and the suffering that it takes to get to the other side. Whatever the enemy has established in your life to make you give up, turn around, and avoid uncomfortable situations. As a child of God, you should look forward to uncomfortable, challenging situations because you know they're designed to move you past your human nature who has a quitting point somewhere in there. And you want to take it and start making it do things it don't want to do. And that's what I would like to challenge you all as we're going through this study. Find things that your human nature doesn't like and start making it do it. Make it listen to music it doesn't want to listen to. Make it eat foods it doesn't want to eat. Make it hang out with people or get be around people that it just doesn't like. And start practicing unconditional love. Stop letting your human nature have its way. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing you again next week. If I don't see you on this side, I'll see you on the other side. So have a blessed night, and we'll close up with prayer. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Oh, Lord God, thank you for this time together tonight. I ask you to continue to lead us and guide us in the way of righteousness. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open our minds to building our faith and our trust in you, Lord God, and what it takes to do so. Lord, fill us with thy spirit that we may be a blessing to all that we come in contact with, that the world would know that hope and deliverance is here as they see our deliverance. I speak blessings upon all of those that are on the broadcast, dear Lord. Touch their hearts and our minds because it's evidence that they have a desire to improve their relationship with you. And this would be great for the kingdom, dear Lord, because it would represent your character here on earth that the world will know the benefit of serving the true and living God in righteousness. Uh, glorify yourself, Father. And it's your authority we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. Good night.